Giving real world examples of how R is used um, in by companies, right? Um, we've seen plenty of how you know plenty of examples of how R is being used, you know, by academics and research papers, pretty much in the stats and econometrics and psychometrics community. If you publish a paper, most likely you will also publish, you know, an R library to go along with it, and that's great. And I think. Um, Maybe part of the things, you know, part of the reasons why we don't see more of it in the commercial industry is because of the proprietary nature and sort of the, you know, the privacy issues that we have um, with companies as we're consulting with them. But what I want to do today is actually um, walk you through some real examples that, you know, us at Pivotal have worked on with uh, real companies. Um, you know, so I'm not going to name the company names, but then, you know, and leave out some details, but I think it's going to give you um, some examples of how it's actually being used. And furthermore, I think I'm going to focus on uh, big data applications of R by these companies. Uh, so it was sort of a narrow scope to kind of begin with, I guess. Um, first of all, to get to these sort of real world examples, I think I need to give a sort of a, a basic overview of sort of what our team at Pivotal are working with. So, um, so Pivotal, we're a technology company, and we actually primarily build software. And so, you know, we have our own Hadoop distribution, we have our own SQL and Hadoop engine. Um, we also have sort of our own sort of cloud operating system for the cloud called Cloud Foundry. Um, and we also have a large services organization called Pivotal Labs. So you guys might be familiar with Pivotal Labs if you're coming from the application development frame, uh, um, community. Basically, they're agile. They started off as an agile development house um, in Silicon Valley. Um, kind of pretty much every big startup that you see today, um, you know, generating from Silicon, Sil Silicon Valley, excuse me, <laughs> um, consulted with Pivotal Labs at one point. Um, and so um, it's great because uh, most recently the data scientists at Pivotal, um, who are their own separate organization, actually kind of joined the Pivotal Labs group. And so we're actually doing some really fun things where we're building data-driven applications for customers. So the, the worst thing to do you can, that you can do with a, with a data science model as you're consulting with companies is put it on a PowerPoint and be done with it, right? Um, that's where kind of models go to die, PowerPoint. <laughs> and so what we wanted to do is actually kind of breathe life into these models by building um, um, sort of these user-facing apps. And to do that, we had to sort of use a technology that would be able to support um, sort of the larger data sets and sort of also make this more scalable and also make this very performant. And so kind of the, I guess, the, the five-second overview of all the stuff that you see here is that we're open sourcing everything pretty much um, by the end of this year. So you guys might be familiar with Greenplum Database. Um, they're a competitor to things like Teradata, uh, Vertica, Natiza. Um, yeah, it's been proprietary for over 10 years. We're completely open sourcing it by the end of this year. Um, we have a SQL on a dupe engine called Hawk, um, which is primarily based on Greenplum. You can think of it as Greenplum working off of HDFS. Um, and that's also being open source by the end of this year. We've already made the announcements. We also have sort of uh, something similar to, Gem I guess, uh, Spark called Gemfire, which is like an in-memory processing grid, except it's much more mature. It's been used by Wall Street traders uh, historically for managing trade transactions, also by online reservation systems. Southwest runs off of Gemfire, for instance, to manage their online sales. Um, open source, that's already been open sourced, actually, um, earlier this year. And so... Everything that I talk about today, by the end of this year, at least, you'll be able to download and kind of work off of your systems um, and just start to play with it. Um, furthermore, um, we have this thing called this kind of uh, the open data platform, which is kind of another thing where I think Pivotal is all about parsimony, right? So we saw so many Hadoop distributions out there, it's like it's go it was kind of getting ridiculous, right? And so like every company who wants to do something in big data has their own Hadoop distributions. That goes the same for Pivotal. And I think we wanted to come to an agreement on standards, on sort of like not making this crazy for application developers and data scientists. Like if I run, if I build a model for one Hadoop distribution, I want to make sure that it's kind of compatible across the board, right, in case like stuff happens later, right? And so um, that's basically what the open data platform is about, where we kind of standardize on some, you know, you know, kind of just basic principles that we can agree upon so that the apps and the models that we build on Hadoop distributions kind of can talk to each other. And so um, one of the biggest Hadoop distributions out there, you know, Hortonworks, they're a part of this. Um, and so pretty much now the other exciting thing is you can run things like Hawk, our Hadoop, or SQL on Hadoop engine, uh, kind of directly off of Hortonworks, which is something crazy because previously we were competing with Hortonworks. And so it's, it's just exciting times for, for a company. Um, 
in terms of the data science toolkit, so I'm going to be primarily talking about um, three things off of this chart. So um, it's one, one is something called Madlib, which is our kind of in-database machine learning library that also works off of Hadoop. Um, also R, primarily kind of two flavors of R that we have um, working off of the Pivotal open source stack. Um, one is PLR, called, um, which is short for Procedural Language R. Um, and also Pivotal R, which is kind of our SQL, excuse me, our R wrapper for SQL, kind of very similar in philosophy to Scale, or excuse me, to Spark R. Yeah. All right, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, okay, so you saw a lot of marketing where about like all this different stuff that we have in our stack, like really simply to kind of just talk about how we as a team, um, we have about 35 data scientists at Pivotal and we literally work on this stack for real customer engagements, right? And so, like, this is literally how we decide, like, what particular tool to use for a given particular problem. And so, we typically start by prototyping in R or, you know, directly inside of our big data tools. Um, and then once we kind of, you know, agree upon a algorithm to use for that engagement or that project, we then ask ourselves the question, is that algorithm available in Madlib? And if it is, then it's an easy thing. We just use it because it's so scalable and it's like, you know, fast, right? <laughs> um, it gets a little more tricky if the answer is no. So for some things like neural networks, if you're doing anything crazy with like Bayesian hierarchical models, let's say, currently not available in, in, in Madlib. Um, but if you are able to explicitly parallelize it, um, this is kind of, I think, similar to the previous talk at KPMG where you kind of have I think you guys are calling it a little bit different, but we call it embarrassingly parallel kind of workflows where um, it's like you can break up a problem into like different groups and then each group can run parallel, you know, um, on different nodes, let's say, of a cluster. If the answer is yes, then you definitely want to build your models in this thing called PLR, which I'll, which I'll introduce today. And you, we should definitely talk about this because I think this will potentially solve a lot of the issues that you guys are uh, facing. In the rare situation where the answer is like no to every single situation on this flowchart, then you're like stuck with like, you know, other things like, you know, doing, you know, your standard ODBC connection where you have to like download everything to your laptop or your R server, which is like so not ideal. And so we rarely, actually we never get into this situation in, in customer projects, but you might, and it's, you know, in the spirit of being complete, just wanted to add that option in there also. So what I'm going to do is actually kind of walk you through a couple of these flowchart examples uh, before we get into the real, real world examples. Um, so what Madlib is, it's basically something similar to MLlib. It's something that we started with um, Joe Hellerstein at uh, UC Berkeley, um, who's in their CS department. He's a professor there. He also started a company called Trifacta. You guys might be familiar with that. Um, but basically, this was a way to say, hey, CRAN is great, but it doesn't scale. Um, so let's do something like CRAN for distributed um, and parallel um, ar architectures. Um, the, you know, there's a listing of the, the stuff that supported today. Um, if you follow this link, it's the documentation page. I mean, it has like 80%, I want to say like 60% to 80% of most of the use cases that um, we face in terms of the algorithms that would be needed to support them. So, you know, it has, you know, things like linear logistic regression, obviously, um, GLMs. Um, elastic net, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, um, you know, support vector machines. It's pretty, pretty good in terms of the, the breadth that it covers. But obviously, because of the challenges required in, or, or kind of involved in paralyzing and distributing these algorithms, like far fewer than the 5,000 libraries that you can get off of CRAN, right? Um, so that was, you know, Madlib, but the, the challenge there is that it's, it's, the end user interface is all SQL. And so uh, what you want to do is actually um, make this more accessible to a wider kind of group of folks. And so uh, we actually built this thing called Pivotal R, which is basically, it's like an R translator for SQL. And, you know, like uh, I believe, you know, that, you know, something that was mentioned earlier was something called dplyr. It has sort of a, sort of a relatively young SQL kind of translator in place already. But um, the goal here is to actually translate R code into SQL code and then basically send that to the, to the database or your Hadoop store to excuse me, to run these models. Um, brief overview of the design. Imagine if you have, you know, your Hadoop cluster or your database on that side, on the right-hand side, and then you have, like, your laptop, let's say, running R. Uh, you have to build a bridge between the two, so it's, like, something like ODBC or, like, R PostgreSQL is also another bridge that people use. 
Um, but the main kind of idea here is that no data lives on your laptop and all the data lives on your Hadoop or database store. And then basically install Pivotal R on your laptop, you can download it, it's on CRAN. And then Pivotal R basically like machine translates your R into SQL and then sends that like string of text um, over to Hadoop or your database. And then what's happening in the background is actually Madlib is actually running and so you're like running you know, uh, support vector machine on like billions of records, let's say, and then all the heavy lifting is basically being done in the Hadoop store. And you get like your computation results, like your summary statistics from the model that you want to look at, et cetera. Um, and that's really kind of, in a nutshell, what PivotalR is doing. And so the, the main point here is that like, you don't want to be doing anything crazy on your laptop. Um, and you want to send everything to your server or your, you know, your Hadoop environment because like, it's so crazy that like, people invest in these Hadoop clusters which are, yeah, it's commodity hardware, but it's so much more powerful than your laptop and you're just like, ignoring it when you're deciding to use your laptop instead for big data, which is just kind of insane, right? Um, but you know, people do that because there is this challenge in kind of using it. And so I guess Pivotal R, Madlib, all these things that I'm going to be talking about today are kind of early attempts at trying to make this you know, easier you know, basically life easier for data scientists um, in the era of big data. Um, you know, there's a brief screenshot of the interface. It's, I'm realizing now that it really sucks, and so you guys can actually check out the video demo um, that's linked in this slide. Um, but basically, it provides wrappers to, to LM, you know, GLM, all these other things that are available in R. And really, like, we, I can't stress this enough, the, the developers really, like, tried hard to, um, like, make this, like, as R-like as possible, and that's why it really takes it's quite some time to release modules in Pivotal R, and so um, you know, basically the, the the set of modules that are available in Pivotal R are a subset of the modules that are available in in Madlib. But we have quite a few. Um, we basically have all the GLM type models. We have uh, we have random forest, decision trees, and most recently we added um, LDA as well. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about this because we don't have time, but. Basically, what I wanted to do is actually talk next about um, PLR because I think this is something that is even more interesting if, um, if you want to run a really fancy algorithm but kind of want to make it run in parallel across many, many nodes. And so um, I don't think I need to go over this slide because I think we've been given an overview of what data parallelism or what embarrassingly parallel workflows are from the previous two talks. But like, it's basically anything that you can do with the apply family of functions in R that's an embarrassingly parallel workflow, right? And then, like, you know, if we had, like, this really, like, insanely large deck of cards, um, if I were to count that by myself, um, that would take a really long time. But if I distributed that to everyone in this room um, and we all kind of did this real live MapReduce job, then it's, you know, it would take much, um, much shorter. So that's what data parallelism, embarrassingly parallel workflows are. And if you're in that scenario, then PLR is something that you definitely want to check out because basically imagine if you have this like cluster, it could be a Hadoop cluster, it could be like your MPP data cluster, um, but you have this cluster running and then like on every single node of this thing you have R running um, like in parallel, right? And it was originally developed for um, Postgres um, by someone named Joe Conway who's actually this big guy or kind of this you know big name in the Postgres community. And we basically took that, piggybacked off of it and just like made it parallel um, for Greenplum and Hawk. Um, and so um, it really pretty much any type of you know, R library that you want to download and run on each of these nodes, it will work with PLR um, on the Pivotal open source tools stack. And so here's an example, right? So like, let's say you were talking about building a separate model for each state in the US. Um, you distribute your data by state and you like, make sure that you, know, you distribute the data for Tennessee on node one, California on node two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you build the models exactly in that same node so you don't have data movement. One of actually the challenges with Spark is that it does data re reshuffling, where basically it doesn't keep the data in the same nodes. Sometimes it needs to reshuffle this data. And because of that, and especially in iterative algorithms, it, it does take longer in some cases than, than some other technologies. And so, um, you know, PLR gives you an explicit way to kind of make sure that the data stays in node one, that it stays in node two, et cetera. Right. So basically the time it takes to run one, uh, a model for one, one state is kind of the same amount of time that it takes to run a model for all states, right? Um, and here's sort of what it looks like in terms of the code, right? So, you know, this is a really basic example. Let's say you want to predict, predict someone's wage um, using some predictors and then you kind of, you know, call some you know, function in R, let's say in this case it's the LM function, and you create basically what's known as a type in SQL. Um, basically, it's, it's a skeleton table um, where basically you create columns um, that you think you're going to use to store results. And in the case of regression, it's like coefficient estimates and summary statistics. 
And then basically you create a R function that says, hey, I want to you know, get these variables as arguments, wage, rent, house, and married, and I want to return a set of LM type, the thing that we created you know, up front. And then basically what you do is just like slide that code into the double dollar signs and then um, you know, have this code run using this function. Right? Um, here's how you execute it. Um, LM was that function that we just created on the previous page. Um, and then if you have that run, then basically here's a partial output. You have what you want for each state. Right? Now that I've kind of you know explained what PLR can do, I kind of actually want to just kind of jump into um, some examples of its use. Um, and I'm going to do that actually by jumping over to some new slides. So I needed to do this because I just needed to give an overview of how this works. I didn't want to just like rush through these examples and say, oh yeah, it kind of just works. I can you know describe how it works later. So now that you kind of know what I'm talking about when I say PLR. Um, I want to do a couple of examples, right? So this is something that we did with uh, a public utilities company in the U.S. Actually, we did something very similar for a utilities company in Canada also. Um, but basically, we wanted to um, detect anomalies in their smart meter network. And so this is really good because, um, you know, with these smart meters, you now can, can predict in advance if a meter has gone down or has, you know, is functioning incorrectly, and then you can do predictive maintenance on it. Before, in the olden days, you literally had to send, like, technicians to regularly check on the meters, and after it failed, it was, like, way too late to correct for it. Like, your customer's already angry and giving you a phone call saying that, you know, the electricity doesn't work. And so what we did was we actually um, looked at sort of the, the load usage patterns of each meter, and then um, did a couple of things, you know, detected anomalies through um, fast Fourier transforms, and also time series analysis was, like, a simple ARIMA model, and then basically we identified these anomalous meters by kind of saying, hey, if you were flagged an anomaly in FFT and if you're flagged an anomaly in, in ARIMA, then like you are the anomalies that we're going to flag for the final list of things to look out for. And like basically we did this in PLR. So imagine if you like distributed all the meters across all your nodes and then like paralyzed it um, using that framework that I just talked about. Um, that's sort of exactly what we did. And then, you know, here's sort of that repeat of the logic. Basically, we want to reduce the number of false alarms and so focusing on that middle uh, brown section in terms of what we flagged as anomalies. Um, here's sort of the code that we used, um, you know, very similar to the LM example that I went through, um, basically using that fast uh, Fourier transform through the spec pgram function in R to get that done. Okay? And here's, you know, some examples, right? So most, you know, electricity usage is like either, you know, daily cycles of usage or you know, um, you know, by daily cycles of usage. Um, basically, uh, we were able to find that you know most of the meters you know fell in these two categories, and then we, in many cases, flagged the ones that didn't fall um, into that you know general subset of of meters. So that's something that we did um, for for smart meters, and like literally, imagine if you're like a smart meter technician or someone um, on the utility side, if you had to like do this manually by looking at graphs like this one by one, it's 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 a nightmare, right? Especially if you're dealing with like millions of meters and billions of readings. And so this is an example of a normal meter that was detected that was not flagged by the model, and then you know this is the one on the bottom that was flagged by the model. What this does is actually gives an opportunity for these technicians to do more useful things, like look at these anomalous meters in more detail, rather than doing like this like crazy thing of looking at like millions of graphs, um, which is you know sounds just horrible, right? So this is something that we we're able to enable for for these utility companies. Um, I have some other ones that I could go through. Um, I don't want to do this one because I think so many people have done stuff in advertisement revenue. But then I think that the main takeaway here, though, is I want to um, kind of highlight the code that we used. Um, to do this. It's actually much more flexible because everything that we've talked about so far assumes that each model on your node is like exactly the same. It's exactly like this LM model that exactly has the same amount of variables. But what you're able to do with, um, if you want to further, further extend the PLR, is actually build a separate unique model for each um, type of you know, group that you're dealing with. In this case, it was magazine publications. So every single magazine title, you can't assume that has, it behaves similarly across the board, right? Title one has to be different from title two, and you can't just apply your vanilla and Riemann model across the board. And so what you're able to do is actually train a very specific set of Riemann models for each, uh, for each um, title, and then basically store that into a metadata um, kind of table or information called, you know, metadata modeling, let's say. And what's, really cool is we're able to piggyback off of this function called eval in R, 
which basically parses that text. And like based on what node you're in at the moment, it knows which specific ARIMA configuration to run for that title so that it gives you like flexibility um, as you're running these models. And so like you're not like doing like this cookie cutter approach to every single magazine title, let's say. Um, and then finally, another cool thing was actually um, something, well, the other thing is I think in terms of visualizations, I think there's like a lot of stuff that needs to be done in this world, but I think you can also build these PDF files in parallel. So everything that we've talked about are like model results that are being spat out by PLR on each node. You can save PDF plots on each node by doing it this way. So like 300,000 um, you know, PDF plots that we had to do for this like semiconductor company, you're able to do you know, using code like this where basically um, we're using the PDF function in R to, to save each, things, each of these files to disk. And I think that's like really cool, right? Because I mean, if you had to do like the serial job to generate all these PDF files, again, it's, it's, that's the bottleneck then, right? But then the ability to do this and like, again, be like super parsimonious, right? Like we're, all we're using here is like just regular R code embedded in SQL. And so like we want to make that kind of as easy as possible to get the job done. And then finally, I think um, something that is really interesting is that you can also parallelize algorithmic development using, using PLR. And um, I want to talk about something uh, called, you know, uh, and, and this is kind of, you know, very specific in the world of uh, hierarchical Bayesian modeling, but I think the estimation procedure in these type of models is, is very complicated. Um, there aren't kind of you know, closed form solution that you can just employ. I mean, there's other things like variational Bayes and things of that nature that are coming out now, but if we wanted to use, you know, sort of the, the classic methods of, of MCMC, um, it's, it's been a challenge. And so people use things like JAG, STAN, um, bugs to get the job done. One thing that you can do is kind of run multiple chains of MCMC um, using this framework and then kind of do the mixing across multiple chains so that you can be sure that you, um, you know, um, essentially are running things in parallel and that things have converged. And again, you do the same thing where you save your model.bug file in every single node and then you kind of refer to it within your R function and then you can do like crazy things like run like, you know, 20 different MCMC chains in parallel um, and then mixing them at the end, right? Um, there is a downside here. Basically, every, the whole data set has to fit on each node to, to get this done because it's an embarrassingly parallel workflow and that doesn't work sometimes, right? Um, it's really cool if, if, if you're in that lucky scenario where that's okay um, and, you know, this is generally the, recommend, or the path that I would recommend folks to take in that scenario. But then we wanted to go further and say, like, what if you're not in that scenario, right? And you actually had to run, like, this crazy Gibbs sampler um, that is distributed across the board. And we had to do this for actually a clothing retail company where they wanted to run some, you know, hierarchical Bayesian models on a lot of data. And um, the end goal was to run sort of, um, excuse me, a, a, a Gibbs sampler, um, a Gibbs sampler on, on, on a large set of data. And to give you like the one minute version of what Gibbs sampling does in the context of hierarchical linear modeling, you have a likelihood, you have priors for each of your parameters. In the case of regression, it's like coefficient parameters and also their variances. Um, and then you also have priors for these hyperparameters themselves. And so it becomes like this crazy thing where if you wanted to get the joint likelihood of all these stuff happening and which is used to compute the posterior, it's basically multiplying, you know, each of these things has a like mathematical formula, right? Because multiplying all those things together and that becomes your posterior distribution formula, except it's like no one, in many cases, no one knows what this thing is. It's like this crazy distribution that's like a mixture of all these different distributions. And so um, what happens then is actually you can take full conditionals off of this joint um, posterior distribution um, and essentially, uh, once you have the full conditional distributions, then you can sequentially um, kind of, you know, draw each component of it um, um, to, to, get to, your, to get to your final estimation kind of goal. And the fact that you can break this up into these different full conditional distributions is what is sort of at the heart of, of, of Gibbs sampling, right? Um, and so, yeah, basically the game plan is figure out which components of that, like, really complicated joint distribution you can embarrassingly parallelize. Um, and that came in kind of two func or kind of two flavors. One is doing the type of thing where you can break up your data into different um, groups and then doing each computation in parallel using PLR. That works sometimes. In other cases, you actually have to parallelize your specific computation itself across all the all the nodes. Like you have to invert a single matrix 
and you just have to do that. And so to, to do that, we actually use some functions in R, also some matrix manipulation operations available in Madlib to get the job done. But essentially, um, you build like these building block functions to um, kind of um, fill in each of the different pieces of the Gibbs sampler. And then once you have like these like worker functions, um, you kind of build this meta function to tie each of these things, things together. It's like the director kind of saying, hey, um, for beta one, I want you to sample off of this distribution and I'm gonna use these component functions to do that. Go. And then for uh, beta two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use these, these component functions to do that. Go. And then for, you know, for your uh, variance parameters, I'm gonna do this. And so basically coming up with like that director that kind of works across each of these different, comp it's like this like meta level, it's like a meta map produce job, I guess, where you're kind of like, like kind of, <laughs> I guess, composing each of these different pieces into, into sort of this symphonic work, I guess. And then um, after you do that, um, you run this for k iterations, and in this case, you're not running a chain off of each single node, but you're actually running one chain in parallel like across all the nodes and then doing that sequentially, right? Um, if you wanted to, you can break up your cluster and then do like chaining and like distributing at the same time, but we didn't try that yet, yeah. But yeah, that's what we did. And then basically, um, we, in terms of the, the building block functions that I talked about, these are kind of some of the examples that we had to that we had to use. And so this is where, again, like it's so great that we have R uh, to do this because like, I needed to sample from the Wishart distribution in, in one scenario to actually do the skip sampler. Uh, there's you know, very few implementations of the Wishart distribution out there, and so we use MCFC PAX uh, implementation of that. Um, you know, same with the multivariate normal distribution. I mean, you know, to get that distribution, we just use the mass library. Um, but like, these are the types of like component functions that we built, and basically this like that director meta function pulled from each of these things and called each of these functions when needed to basically um, run that Gibbs sampler. Um, and here's sort of, you know, what the meta function sort of looked like. You know, there was two functions to initialize the Gibbs sampler and then a second function to update that Gibbs sampler. So to initialize it is to get that very first iteration. And then to update is basically you say, hey, using sort of the, uh, the initial draws, I want to update it, um, you know, up to a K number of iterations. And then uh, we made it so that you can pick up from where you left off. So if you stopped at like 5,000 and you like had to go get lunch, then you can start off again at 5,001 um, after lunch. All right, and so um, hopefully that was like, I know it was a lot of stuff. I just needed to like give you guys sort of a context of like how this technology works first, because I mean, you know, although these tools are great, I mean, not obviously not everyone knows what PLR is and, and PivotalR is, and so I wanted to make sure that we had that down before I got into the specific examples, but like, you know, I have way more that I can share with you after the talk if you're more interested. Um, but then I think, you know, there's, I, I can't, you know, I have to be honest in saying that Pivotal R isn't the only SQL or the R translator for SQL that's out there. You know, there's there's other things that we can kind of look towards, and maybe you know it's it's a it's a collaboration thing where we kind of share notes and kind of come to this single thing because I don't want it to become like this Hadoop distribution thing again, where every you know every person has like their own R on SQL translator, and that would become crazy. Also, um, we also kind of want to explore closer integration with things like Spark and ML11 and H2O um, to kind of you know you know, perhaps, you know, economize on sort of the algorithm development for distributed and parallelized um, 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 workflows. And then the final thing is that PLR is great, but right now it's still SQL embedded, excuse me, R code embedded inside of SQL. What we want to do is actually build PLR wrappers for Pivotal R so that you can do all this stuff from the R command line and you can avoid the SQL prompt um, entirely. And so this is something that's on a roadmap. Um, so thanks so much. Um, I think I might have gone like a minute or two over time, but you know, happy to take questions afterwards if we don't have time. Thank you.